Hello my bookworms, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I will be giving you oddly specific personalized book recommendations. So hey, what's up, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for being here and hanging out with me for a little bit. Over on Instagram, I put up a question box asking for you guys to give me situations, vibes, emojis, from which I will give personalized book recommendations to. If it doesn't make sense, it will shortly. <laughs> the first one I'll do is a pretty easy one, and it's a request for a book that has an animal companion. I have two for you. One of them you won't be surprised about. <laughs> the first one I will give is Lotsoe by Darcy Little Badger. I know, this one is like middle grade, young adult age, so it's a little bit out of pocket for me, but this book was so good. Not only is there an animal companion in this story, but it is a ghost. It's a ghost dog that is the animal companion. Our main character is a Latsue who can raise the ghosts of dead animals. This is a skill passed down from generations within her Lopin Apache family, and she ends up getting news that her beloved cousin gets murdered in a town that wants no prying eyes, but a Latsue will do much more than pry. The picture-perfect facade of Willoughby masks gruesome secrets, and she will rely and her wits, skills, and friends to tear off the mask and protect her family. This book has whimsy, it has danger, it has a mystery, and all of this is woven in within this story that is brimming with indigenous culture. The ghost dog is amazing, and I implore you to try this one out. The other book with an animal companion is obviously going to be Once in Future Witches by Alex e. Harrow. I can't go a singular recommendation video without mentioning at least some of my favorite books, and this one obviously has a crow. It is surrounding three magical sisters who, within growing up, become estranged, but later on, they all end up finding themselves in Salem, where they are basically joining the women's suffragist movement, but soon it is going to turn into the witches' movement. With all of the sketchy things going on within this town, these three sisters will have to delve into the oldest magics, draw new alliances, and heal the bond between them if they want to survive. There's no such thing as witches, but there will be. This book in particular is really great around fall time, so if you pick it up right now, it might be perfect. <laughs> the atmosphere is phenomenal, the storyline is fun, and I just fell in love with these three sisters. Obviously, it's one of my favorites, so read it. The next request was a series of emojis. It was basically a black heart, an anchor, and a sword, and an ocean, and an anchor, and a sword, and a heart. <laughs> now, first book that came into mind when I saw this might not be the very first one that you would think of, and maybe it's because I just finally finished this story, and it is really the only thing taking up my mental space, but it makes sense, so I'm going to do it anyways. It is The Fragile Threads of Power by V.E. Schwab. This is the first book in a new series set within her world of a darker shade of magic, which you should read that trilogy before you start this one, which I highly recommend. But within the story, obviously without giving any spoilers, we are following some of our main characters from the previous trilogy, as well as meeting a lot of new ones. And there's a good chunk of the story where we are at sea, or we are following sword play, or the black heart could be, I don't know, dark magic or something, because there's a lot of that going on too. <laughs> there's a ton of high stakes in this story, and if you have read the Darker Shade of Magic series, like brush up a little bit on the history and then go into this one because it will be one of my favorites of the year. I'll be surprised if it doesn't make that list. It was so great. The next request is a disillusioned female who is also painfully romantic, bitter, sad vibes. I loved this one, <laughs> and I feel like I have the perfect recommendation for you. It is going to be Writers and Lovers by Lily King. Writers and Lovers is about our main character, Casey, who is recently blindsided by her mother's death and wrecked by a recent love affair. At 31, she is still clutching on to something nearly all her friends have let go of, and that is the determination to live a creative life. When she falls for two very different men at the same time, her world fractures even more. Casey's fight to fulfill her creative ambitions and balance the conflicting demands of art and life is challenged in ways that push her to the brink. We're following Casey in the last days of a long youth, a time when every element of her life comes to a crisis. So she's going through grief, heartbreak, hope, and then obviously she's a hopeless romantic. She falls for two different guys at the same time. It's messy, it's complicated, it's written so well. I read it in literally one sitting. I feel like it fits perfectly. The next one was when you don't want to use brain cells after a hard day, but also don't want to lose brain cells either. <laughs> My immediate thought was like a fun contemporary romance. That is the first place that I go when I don't want to think too hard, but I want to have like still a great time reading, obviously. And there are so many contemporary romances that I could recommend you. So I might just throw out a few of my favorites and you can pick one as you see fit. But a few of my favorite recent and not so recent romances that I absolutely love and will go down in history is The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran. Any Emily Henry book, but I specifically wrote down Book Lovers because it was just so funny. And 
absolutely part of your world by Abby Jimenez. All three of those bring different things to the table. Part of your world is a little bit of a small town, grumpy sunshine where he's the sunshine and she's a little bit more hesitant on the whole situation. Book Lovers is a enemies to lovers romance and the banter is just top notch. And of course, The Charm Offensive. One of my favorite queer romances like forever. This book made me sob, <laughs> but like in the best way. That one is set around almost like bachelor style TV show where a main character is on the show and one of our set producers is his like handler and they end up falling for each other. It has really good mental health representation as well. So take your pick of the three or all of them. <laughs> the next one I felt so hard for and it is when you're not sure where you belong. This is giving coming of age vibes. So here are a few. <laughs> The one I most recently read, and I actually have it sitting next to me because I don't know where any of the previous books are, is Old Enough by Haley Jacobson. Check the trigger warnings before reading this one, but this is about our main character who is being held back from her previous like high school friendships and situations, but is now in her freshman year of college and is finding her own place within her new group of queer friends and dorm mates. She's finally just feeling like she is becoming who she always knew that she was and could be while going through and healing from past trauma. This book made me cry. It was a lot and I loved it a lot. <laughs> her finding herself and finding her place gives me the vibe of when you're not sure where you belong because she finally found it. You know what I'm saying? Next is one that I read forever ago and I think it has to go down in one of my favorites because I think about it far too often for it not to be considered a favorite. It is Dress Codes for Small Towns by Courtney Stevens. This story is about Billy who is a tomboy preacher's daughter, doesn't really fit in with the, you know, more like prim and proper sort of crowd and she loves like making furniture and weird cool art sculptures in the garage with her founder family of friends. But within these friends, Janie Lee confesses to Billy that she is in love with Woods, which is one of the boys within the friend group. Billy is filled with a nagging sadness as she realizes that she is also in love with Woods and maybe with Janie Lee too. Always considered one of the guys, Billy doesn't want anyone slapping a label on her sexuality before she can understand it herself. So she keeps her conflicting feelings to herself for fear of ruining the group dynamic. Except it's not just about keeping the peace, it's about understanding love on her terms. This thing that has always been and defined as a boy and a girl falling in love and happily ever after. But for Billy, it's just not that simple. And it follows that situation where she is also, you know, finding herself, coming of age and going through different situations with different people. I do remember when I was first starting it that the writing style and sense of humor I had to get used to, but once I did, I was thoroughly having a great time. Like I said, I think about it so much and I feel like it definitely fits for this recommendation. My last recommendation for this one in particular is Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. I remember that this book made me cry on like page five. I don't know. I remember it viscerally. <laughs> in the story, we're following two girls. One is Camino, who lives in the Dominican Republic and the other is Yahira who lives in New York City. Camino lives for the summers because that's when her father flies in to visit her. But this summer, the plane does not arrive safely. While in New York City, Yahira is sent to the principal's office to hear the news that her father died in a plane crash. Separated from distance and poppy secrets, these two girls are forced to face a new reality in which their father is dead and their lives are forever altered. And then when it seems like they've lost everything of their father, they learn of each other. I feel like this book works for this recommendation because it could literally be interpretive as like not knowing where you belong, growing up with multiple cultures. And I know that these characters go through that of not knowing where they should consider home once they learn of all of this new information that is changing their lives. And it's obviously told with Elizabeth Acevedo's beautiful lyrical poetic writing. 100% would recommend. This next one made me laugh out loud. <laughs> It says, stepping on a leaf, you're expecting to be crunchy or crisp and it makes no sound. <laughs> It's such like a sad thing, right? Like the most unsatisfying situation, dare I say. And I don't wanna think about the recommendation in terms of that, but that is where my mind went first. I was like, why would I recommend you a book that's unsatisfying? But instead I'm going to go down the like quiet route. Like you expect it to be loud, but it plays with sound. And my recommendation is All's Well by Mono Awad. If I'm not mistaken, and I hope I'm not, <laughs> there's a specific scene towards like the climax of the story where our main character is struggling to hear something. Like if you know Mona Awad's writing and you've read from her before, you know that her stories kind of go into like a fever dream situation where you're not really sure what's going on, but you're along for the ride. <laughs> and during the climax of this story, I think that sound is played with in terms of the main character not being able to hear what's going on or getting so much sensory from other things. So it shuts down completely. This one might be a little bit of a stretch, but I feel like it works. This story in particular is following Miranda 
Miranda, who after an accident has been struggling with chronic pain and a dependence on painkillers. I think she works at a high school, but it might be like a community college. I'm not entirely sure. I think it's a high school. And she's determined to put on Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well, but the mutinous cast is hell bent on staging Macbeth instead. That's when she meets three strange benefactors who have an eerie knowledge of Miranda's past and tantalizing promise for her future. One where the show goes on, her rebellious students get what's coming to them, and the invisible doubted pain that's kept her from the spotlight is made known. Not only is this a book that feels like a leaf that was supposed to sound crunchy but didn't, <laughs> But it is also for my girlies who love theater, but also love extremely like fever dreamy weird stories. This one's for you for sure. The next one is you want to go back to the whimsy of your books growing up, but also want a little darkness. I thought this one was super fun. <laughs> and boy, do I have two recommendations for you. The first one is The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. This is kind of the perfect recommendation for this one because not only is this like a classic childhood fairy tale fantasy book, but it has some really dark elements within it. It says the unicorn Corin lived in a lilac wood and she lived all alone. So she ventured out from the safety of the enchanted forest on a quest for others of her kind. Joined along the way by a bumbling magician Schmendrick and the indomitable Molly Gru, the unicorn learns all about the joys and sorrows of life and love before meeting her destiny in the castle of a despondent monarch and confronting the creature that would drive her kind to extinction. The visuals portrayed within this story is actually sort of incredible. The atmosphere is phenomenal. And again, like I said, there is some like darker moments, especially towards the first half of the book. There's like a carnival situation where I was like a little bit uncomfortable, <laughs> but this one's super fun. And it does have a new introduction by Patrick Rolfus, which was super fun to read as well. The other recommendation is Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. I feel like this is a really fun fantasy story. It definitely has the whimsy because it's funny and the adventure is exciting, but the magic and the situation at hand has some pretty high stakes. This one also actually has an animal companion sort of, if you want to include it in the other one too. Next one says anything that will match the energy of the night circus. And the recommendation that fits this to a T is where dreams descend. There's magicians, there's a magical competition, there's a circus sort of in the background, but the circus is still there. The focus on this one is the magical competition and there is a subplot of romance, just like the night circus. If you want night circus vibes like this, this is it. It's also a duology, so you can enjoy it twice. The next one is a book that's spoopy, but not too spoopy. <laughs> and for this one, I want to recommend Starling House by Alex E. Harrow. I feel like it's a really good mix of like spooky atmosphere and like fairy tale mystery. In this story, we're following our two main characters. One of them is the warden of Starling House, which has been passed down through generations of not familial ancestry, but like people get called to be the warden of this house. And they are basically warding off evil, so to say, because there are unnatural things that go on within these grounds of Starling House. And our other main character ends up working as sort of like a maid within the house and starts to clean it up and gets close with the warden. And she starts to learn all all of the ins and outs of the history surrounding her family, his family, which coincides with the history of the house and the town. And there are some dark things that go on, some spoopy scenes, but it's not too spoopy. You should be good. I would recommend it. It was super fun. The next one was a book that makes me forget that I'm reading. And I just want to recommend the last book that made me fully immerse myself within the story. And I actually had to like drag my eyes from the page and look at my surroundings to make sure that I wasn't actually in that world. And that was Pyrenees by Susanna Clark. The atmosphere and imagery within this story is just so compelling. It is so beautifully written that it for sure goes down as one of my favorites always. I would definitely say that this is another book where it's a little bit weird. You kind of have to go with the flow because it says, Peronese's house is no ordinary building. Its rooms are infinite, the corridors endless, and walls are lined with thousands upon thousands of statues, each one different from all the others. Within the labyrinth of halls, an ocean is imprisoned. Waves thunder up the staircases. Rooms are flooded in an instant, but Peronese is not afraid. He he understands the tides as he understands the pattern of the labyrinth itself. He lives to explore the house. There is one other person in the house, a man called The Other, who visits Piranesi twice a week and asks for help with research into a great and secret knowledge. But as Piranesi explores, evidence emerges of another person and a terrible truth begins to unravel, revealing a world beyond the one Piranesi has always known. This book just truly drew me into the world and I felt like I was in a vast hall with oceans lapping up around me. Like it was 
was beautiful. And I think it definitely has the potential to make you forget that you're reading. Also, I'm coming back to recommend the Faithful and the Fallen series because it is the most all immersive high fantasy story that I have read in a very long time. If you've been here for longer than a minute, you know that it's my favorite series ever now. And if a high political war story fantasy with a lot of characters and a lot of storylines is your jam, then this series could be so good for you. It is Skyrim vibes to a T. And there were so many days that I just blinked and my day was over because I forgot I was reading this book literally all day. Okay, the next one is a book that I'm recommending specifically to this one that says Irish folklore, changeling, spooky, foggy vibes. But there were a ton of extra requests that had like a compilation of emojis like this one and this one where I feel like this could also work for it. And the book is Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies. Now, I personally did not like this book, but that doesn't mean that you won't. I'm still recommending it because I know it has an audience out there and I know that people really do enjoy it. So just because I didn't like it doesn't mean you won't like it. So if it sounds fun, I implore you to try it. It's basically about our main character, Emily Wilde, who is compiling an encyclopedia of fairies. And she is going off to this hard scrabble village of Hransvik to research like a very specific type of fairy that people don't really know about. It has a little subplot of romance because her academic rival, Wendell Bambleby, surprises her and decides to tag along. The story has like small town vibes. The people don't really want to help her. And I'm like 90% sure that there is a changeling within the story, obviously in addition to the fey folk. And again, even though it's not my cup of tea, doesn't mean that it can't be your cup of tea. <laughs> this next one is The Smell of Rain, but not depressing. <laughs> Perfect. And I do feel like A River Enchanted by Rebecca Ross fits this one pretty well. This book is set on a magical island and it's a little bit like foggy and rainy. So when I read that request, this is the first book that popped into my head because I don't know if I can like say it adequately, but like the aura that this book gives off to my mind is sort of like a rainy, foggy vibe, but it's not super depressing. It's like a magical island where our main character grew up there, but gets called back later because on the island, multiple girls are going missing and they think that our main character who's coming back is the only person that can help them find the missing girls. And he's a bard, so he's able to play music and interact with sort of like the magical side of the island, but it comes to him at a cost. The writing is really beautiful. There is a little B plot of romance and it is a start to a duology, which both of them are out. The next one was Commentary on the Human Condition, which I was really excited that this one came up because I just recently read this book in the last month or so. And it is, it's perfect. It's exactly it. It is outlined by Rachel Cusk. This book is about our main character who is going, I think to Athens to teach like a creative writing class. And each chapter is basically just a conversation that she's having with another person, whether it be someone she's meeting for the first time or someone she's meeting up with from her past. And it's all about connections and how we tell our stories to one another. I have a little post on my Instagram actually of all of my favorite quotes that I've underlined while I was reading it. There's like a little carousel of them, you know? And it's not a book that I would recommend to a whole bunch of people because it is kind of an acquired taste. There are not a lot of paragraph breaks. It seems like a little bit of stream of consciousness, but it really does talk about like the human condition and just our connections with other people. And it's really, really beautiful. It's the start to a series. There's three of them. I don't know what the other two will have in store for me, but I put them on my wish list because I definitely want to continue. I really liked this one. <laughs> the next one is something where reading it in public would give cool girl vibes, but it's also a five star read. I wanted to give a really good one for this one because I just really like it. <laughs> and I could have gone one of two ways. I could have gone with a more like romance sort of cool girl vibe or go down the road that I feel more comfortable in. <laughs> and it's the like pretentious dark academia vibes. And so I chose If We Were Villains by ML Rio. I know that if I saw someone reading a book with this cover in public, I would immediately want to get to know them. I'd be like, what is that book? Who are you? Can we be friends? And obviously not to mention this is a five-star read for me. So it fits the bill. It's kind of furthered even more because it is surrounding a set of like Shakespearean students and they go in and out of prose of Shakespeare throughout this story. So there is an air of pretentiousness about it, which I feel like fits with like a cool girl vibe, at least to me. <laughs> and if you haven't read this book yet, I definitely recommend it because it is super fun. Basically there were seven friends within this Shakespearean school. And in their final year of this college, something goes horribly wrong on opening night and they wake up the next day and one of their friends is dead. And one of the friends actually goes down for the murder. But fast forward so many years later and this person is getting out of prison, meeting with the detective who was lead on the case years ago. And he's just basically wanting to know like, hey, what actually happened? No repercussions will happen. I just want to know. And so the story is following our main character telling the story of what happened on that night. <laughs> 
Caleb sanding the walls for my bookshelves upstairs and he just came down in almost like a hazmat suit. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this book was a like a four star read for me until the last like 100 pages, 75 ish of the book. It gets so good and a little bit unhinged. I just love it so much. It is a perfect fall read as well. The next one is an epic adventure, fantasy, character development, not opposed to some romance elements. And for this one, I wanted to recommend Crown of Feathers by Nikki Paupretto. This is book one in a completed trilogy. And it says, in a world ruled by fierce warrior queens, a grand empire was built on the backs of Phoenix riders. Legendary heroes who soared through the sky on wings of fire until a war between two sisters ripped it all apart. And now there are two sisters who are basically vying for the throne. One of them is Veronica who dreams of becoming a phoenix rider from the stories of old. And after a shocking betrayal from her controlling sister, she strikes out alone to find the riders, even if it means disguising herself as a boy to join their ranks. But is a fact of life that one must kill or be killed, rule or be ruled. Just as Veronica finally feels like she belongs, her sister turns up and reveals a tangled web of lies between them that will change everything. And meanwhile, the new empire has learned of the writer's return and intends to destroy them once and for all because they don't want them taking over the empire again. They thought that they killed them all off. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes the title of queen is given and sometimes it is taken. I have only read book one, but this is a series that I want to pick up as soon as possible and finish because that first book was five stars for me. It went down as like most surprising of that year. I think I read it two years ago, maybe a year ago. I'm not too sure. The character development and the storytelling and the plot and everything, it was really really, really solid. There is a little subplot of romance. It's not a focus point, but there is a little bit there. And I feel like it could scratch the itch for this recommendation. The last one that I want to do is a book that you would recommend Juno or Avi. She just perked up at that. <laughs> I want to do Juno first because hers is really easy. I knew exactly what book I would recommend her and it is House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. I just feel like Juno's into some weird shit. Like her favorite book is probably Bunny by Mona Watt. <laughs> and I feel like House of Hollow has like the perfect level of weird and type of like horror elements that she would be really into. And this book in particular is about 17 year old Iris Hollow who has always been strange. Something happened to her and her two older sisters when they were children, something they can't quite remember, but that left each of them with an identical half moon scar at the base of their throats. Iris has spent most of her teenage years trying to avoid the weirdness that sticks to her like tar. But when her eldest sister Gray goes missing under suspicious circumstances, Iris learns just how weird her life can get. Horned men start shadowing her, a corpse falls out of her sister's ceiling, and ugly, impossible memories start to twist their way to the forefront of her mind. As Iris retraces Grey's last known footsteps and follows the increasingly bizarre trail of breadcrumbs she left behind, it becomes apparent that the only way to save her sister is to decipher the mystery of what happened to them as children. The closer Iris gets to the truth, the closer she comes to understanding that the answer is dark and dangerous, and that Grey has been keeping a terrible secret from her for years. It is right up Juno's alley. She would eat this up. And and then as for Avi, I mean, she is a little bit more difficult to recommend because I feel like she's into a lot of things. <laughs> I don't think that she's like a thriller girly. I think that she is a lot softer than she lets on. I do get fantasy vibes from her. I actually wrote down Sword of Kaigen by M.L. Wang for her. Off the top of your head, do you know what books you would recommend to Avi and Juno? Oh geez, for Avi I'd probably do like... I thought maybe she was like fantasy. I was thinking self-help. Self-help? <laughs> Well, I was thinking like a more complicated romance that like the characters have been through some shit and you know, she lives and she learns from it. Cause I think that she's really soft. Yeah, I, I can see that. So it was either Sword of Kaigen or Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. Those were the two that I would recommend to Avi. Bogos is perfect. Like weird body horror or like body just horror. like, <laughs> look at her scamping around. Look at her. Yeah, she heard body horror and came running. <laughs> I mean, Avi does like the thrill of the kill as well, though. Could do. I could see, like... <laughs> Something like that is why I kind of, like, did Spells for Forgetting for Avi, too, perhaps, because it's, like, a fantasy mystery thriller, so it's not, like, super heavy on the thriller, but, like, just enough to excite her, like, killer instinct of squirrels. But I do think that she's, like, a fantasy girly at heart. With a magical island, I think Avi could be really into it. Avi could be into a lot of different things. She's open-minded. Speaking of Avi, we have to go take her on her afternoon walk. So, so that is all that I have for you guys today. Thank you all for participating 
came in submitting recommendations. You all really showed up this time. There were so many to choose from. I do hope to do these more often. Make sure to check out my Instagram and follow me over there so that you can participate in things like this. Usually it'll be on my stories where I collect information. But yeah, thank you guys so much for being here and hanging out with me for a little bit. If you are still watching, leave your favorite animal emoji down below in the comments. And while you're down there, don't forget to subscribe and like the video. I always appreciate your support. And of course, be kind to one another and happy reading. Bye.